Welcome to the show, everyone. It's the Crypto Lark. I'm very, very excited to have on the show today Andreas Antonopoulos. He's Bitcoin educator, tech entrepreneur, host of the most educational YouTube channel related to Bitcoin and podcast as well. So, and he's an author of many, many fantastic books, including The Internet of Money, which is one of my personal favorites. I'd pick it up and show it to you today, but it's actually been lent out to one of my friends because a book on a shelf isn't doing a lot of good oh, in terms of spreading oh. knowledge. So, aha, there it the, is. Uh... That's the third uh, volume of the series, yeah. Fantastic, fantastic. There'll be links down below for the podcast, the YouTube channel, and where you can grab some of those books as well. But Andreas, thank you so much for coming on the channel to have a chat with me today about Bitcoin. Oh, thank you. It's a real pleasure. Uh, looking forward to this. So I think let's just go ahead and really dive straight into this. And I think let's start off with talking a little bit about maybe some of the, the bigger mission of Bitcoin. And I think what we can start off with is talking about your thoughts on where the dollar is heading these days. I mean, do you see a situation where we could be seeing hyperinflation coming or are we going to move into a more deflationary economy? We all know that meme that goes around Bitcoin fixes this, but but is it really fixing this? And has this crisis kind of lifted the veil, do you think, for a lot of people on the, the uh, falseness of fiat? Yeah, um, you know, when, when people talk about what uh, Bitcoin's real mission is, there seem to be really two big camps. Um, one camp is uh, a monetary perspective, an economic perspective that is about sound money, uh, scarcity, limited supply, um, and um, low inflation. And the other camp is um, looking at Bitcoin as an open international currency that is accessible to all, anywhere, anytime, without vetting or authorization, uh, available to the unbanked and underbanked, and a non-political, neutral, and open protocol for the internet that makes money possible on a much larger scale and creates economic inclusion. I'm in the latter camp. Um, so my perspective on the monetary economics of Bitcoin isn't probably as strident as you might uh, think. And um, I, I'm not sure how this plays out economically. To me, that's not the biggest and most interesting feature of uh, Bitcoin. But obviously, it's important to many and the economic implications are huge. So, um, you know, it, it's funny how the, the most salient characteristic of Bitcoin from a monetary perspective is revealed primarily when um, international uh, currencies, various international currencies, especially the reserve currency, the dollar, and others shoot themselves in the foot in the most spectacular fashion um, and uh, create economic conditions that are very dangerous. Uh, I like to say often uh, that um, I'm here to talk to you about the biggest monetary experiment and the most crazy risky experiment that's ever happened. And no, that's not Bitcoin. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's the infinite uh, quantitative easing, infinite stimulus, uh, unlimited printing, and unlimited debt experiment. Uh, I, I think it's important to realize this has never happened before. So all of the people who are like trying to place bets on how this turns out, hyperinflation, deflation, um, stagflation, spirals, um, uh, de-dollarization and all of these other things, they have no clue. Nobody has any clue. Um, and part of the reason for that is because we have no historical analog to go back to. This has never happened before. Uh, certainly not on this scale, but, but not even in terms of the fundamentals. Um, I think we're entering a very dangerous period. And the reason it's a dangerous period it is not so much because of the economic impact um, of these moves, but more the political impact of these moves. And to me, the political impact of these moves is that we have detached from market forces and, um, and the fundamental economic uh, basis for, for market pricing. And, and what that means is that we've moved into um, the territory of centrally managed economies um, that are fine-tuned by um, technocrats, uh, and we've seen that experiment before. So we know that doesn't end well, because if you disconnect from market signals, um, a lot of malinvestment and misallocation of funds tends to happen. Uh, no, no country can really scale, uh, especially a country as big as the United States, can really scale decision-making to the point where a few central bureaucrats can decide which companies are essential, which companies are non-essential, which companies should receive um, support, which companies should not. Uh, which employees should, um, how to allocate uh, these enormous amounts of money that, that dwarf uh, gross domestic product. And, and all of these moves essentially um, basically remove markets from the equation. That's a very dangerous move.
We've seen with the current crisis that's going on, a lot of talk around implementing central bank digital currencies, Libra is getting a lot of attention. Once again, um, we saw the, I think it was the first or second draft of the stimulus package in the US, the first stimulus package, not the third or the fourth one, the Rons, who now actually including language around a digital dollar. Do you think that yeah. Libra and a central bank digital currency issued by whether it's be the United States or China or the European Union, whoever else, is this going to help or hurt Bitcoin? It's gonna be entirely irrelevant to Bitcoin. Um, it's, it's a bit like, um, you know, um, introducing a new uh, model of cars and saying, is this going to help or hurt the airline industry? Um, we're flying above all that shit. Uh, the bottom <laughs> line is uh, Libra, central bank digital currencies, um, all of those systems lack the fundamental components that make Bitcoin interesting and different. Uh, they're not different at all. Uh, I use an acronym to remind uh, my viewers uh, what the fundamentals are, and that the acronym is RIPCORD because we're having to parachute out of a, a crashing plane here. Um, and RIPCORD st stands for Revolutionary Immutable Public Collaborative Open Resistant and Decentralized. And guess what? Central bank digital currencies, Libra, corporate currencies um, are not that. They're centralized, they're controlled, they're surveillance mechanisms. They have none of the um, characteristics of open public uh, blockchain cryptocurrencies. Um, the interesting thing about these new uh, technological uh, currencies is that they're not controlled by a single party. Uh, in fact, their control is decentralized and they're open to anyone to participate and they remove all of the barriers to entry um, and friction points of vetting authorization uh, and control. So from that perspective, uh, they introduced something really novel to the monetary system, really truly open, global, borderless, neutral currencies, which have never existed before. And the CBDCs are, are simply taking, um, taking the, the name of blockchain, if they even have anything to do with that technology, and, and trying to wrap the same pig in a, in a new package, uh, you know, put lipstick on it and serve it up as something revolutionary, something disruptive, something new. It's nothing new. Um, in fact, it's dangerous. Uh, both, both corporate currencies like Libra and central bank digital currencies are extremely dangerous um, because the, uh, the end point here is the eradication of cash as an open peer-to-peer -peer, transparent anonymous mechanism for transacting that no one needs permission to use. And we're reaching the end of the era of cash. Uh, and our future is going to be digital currencies. Uh, the question now is whether those digital currencies are going to be centrally controlled and surveilled and uh, private. The, and the problem is that if you give uh, centralized institutions control over um, something as important as money in a society, they can use that control to amass enormous power, they can use that control to crush any dissent or opposition, and they will start picking winners and losers, and they can turn off anybody, um, their entire financial lives, your ability to buy food uh, by flipping a bit in a database. Uh, that is a very scary world. And of course, you know, first they're going to come for the terrorists, and then they're going to come for the child pornographers, and then they're going to come for the, I don't know, pot sellers and gun sellers and porn magazine makers and God knows what else. And then they're going to come for anyone who speaks up about anything that's contrary to their politics. Uh, this is a very, very dangerous path. Totalitarian surveillance of money leads to totalitarian politics, uh, and it's an unavoidable outcome. So we need to make a very smart choice here. And the choice is to use the open, decentralized and neutral currencies of the people rather than the closed surveillance totalitarian currencies of either nation states reinventing themselves or corporations trying to become nation states. You said it very, very well there. Do do you think that we could actually see a country being brave enough to embrace public open networks to actually issue their central bank currency on a public open network or to actually start acquiring Bitcoin for a central bank reserve? Who cares? 
it, it doesn't really matter. So the endorsement of national uh, institutions of an open decentralized internet-based cryptocurrency is irrelevant. Um, it's, it's almost like saying, uh, will governments build websites to offer their government services on the web? Uh, who cares? That's not where the action is happening. Um, the way the old world will try to adapt to a new environment uh, is irrelevant to that new environment. What really matters is whether people will choose to use this among many other cryptocurrencies, whether they will have that choice and whether they will exercise that choice, not in exclusion or replacement of their state currencies, but as an alternative that gives them better results, better freedoms. This is about open markets for currencies. And so the centralized endorsement or authorization of a, a nation state uh, is irrelevant in the era of the internet. Yes, some countries are probably going to adopt it just like um, you know, some countries have adopted the dollar as their de facto national currency because they either can't afford to print their own uh, or because their own has collapsed ir irretrievably. Um, but again, who, who cares? We're not, we're not looking for approval. Um, that, that's, uh, it's a bit like saying, uh, do you think some of the horse buggy manufacturers are eventually going to uh, transform themselves into automotive manufacturers? Who cares? <laughs> I want to switch the conversation up a little bit here from kind of the bigger vision stuff to I want to talk about the Lightning Network. Do you think that the hmm. Lightning Network has kind of lived up to its promise? Um, why have we not seen more support from wallets and from exchanges to actually implement the Lightning Network? I mean, currently, we, I think we see more Bitcoin locked up and tokenized on Ethereum than there is Bitcoin locked up on the Lightning Network. So is this a failure of the Lightning Network or is it still just trying to find its feet? Oh, it's it's so early um, to, I mean, I, I don't think we can really call winners and losers. Now, keep in mind, I'm biased. I'm writing a book about the Lightning Network because I think it's a fascinating technology. Um, but it's really, really early days. This is like the web in 1998, 99. And, um, and it really hasn't come into its own. Uh, one of the important things to realize about all of these technologies is that um, the innovation is happening in different layers. Um, and when you have innovation like the Lightning Network, which is actually accelerated innovation in the Bitcoin space by opening up um, to new APIs and uh, new more rapid development models. Uh, when, when new things are introduced at the protocol level, those effectively do not exist until they exist in a user interface for users. Um, so this is one of the fundamental issues we have in any of these technologies. You can make something great, a new technology, and then if none of the wallets implement it, it doesn't exist. Um, and you have to wait for the wallets to catch up. And wallets are actually one of the least monetized, least well-invested um, infrastructure components in the entire blockchain space. They're the weak point. Um, so as as a result, um, it may take two or three years until you see these uh, technologies trickle in to, to wallets. On average, it takes about three years. So we're nowhere near seeing the full potential. Um, I think the Lightning Network is a fantastic technology, and I don't really see it as competing against other technologies like decentralized finance that's happening in Ethereum. All of these are complementary, and they work very well together. Do you think that Bitcoin's lack of privacy could be a problem? I know we've seen, for example, we do have the Wasabi wallet, which gives people the option to send private transactions. But on the flip side, we've seen uh, regulators come after a Bitcoin mixer developer in the past. And we have companies like Chainalysis, which provide governments with details on Bitcoin transactions. So is this a flaw of Bitcoin? Is it a, should we have more privacy on Bitcoin or is this a, a plus of Bitcoin? It's a flaw of Bitcoin, uh, most certainly, and I've been talking about that for six or seven years now, about the importance of privacy and strengthening privacy in Bitcoin. Um, j just to make a point there, uh, they didn't come after a developer of mixing services. They came after an operator of mixing servers, which is a very, very different thing. Uh, no one has uh, so far uh, prosecuted developers for writing software that they themselves do not operate. So that would be a, a very serious First Amendment issue. Um, so uh, in, in Bitcoin, security and privacy is difficult. Uh, you have to be very careful in order to maintain your privacy. And that's a weakness. Um, fortunately, there are a number of technologies that are making that uh, are likely to make that much better. Uh, one of them is a, a series of uh, uh, changes that are being introduced to Bitcoin now um, 
Schnorr signatures, Taproots, and TapScript are the technical names, but in any case, it's, it's a package that allows um, transactions to appear as if they're a simple payment when they're much more complex script. So for example, um, a transaction that opens and closes a lightning channel, instead of uh, being easily identifiable as such and allowing you to identify which channel and which nodes interacted with it, uh, instead will appear as a single payment from a sender to a recipient uh, mixed among all of the other payments. Uh, in technical terms, what that does is it increases the anonymity set of transactions um, making it much more difficult to do uh, this kind of analysis. Uh, companies like Chain Chainalysis and others are, are basically in an arms race against privacy. Um, and uh, what they're doing is they're providing uh, the world's worst uh, dictators and regimes, either directly or indirectly, uh, with information that violates uh, the civil rights of millions of people. Um, I think it's uh, fundamentally immoral uh, to even work at a company like this. And um, uh, just like I would consider it immoral to work for a weapons manufacturer or uh, you know, a company that builds cages for refugee concentration camps. Um, you have to make some choices when you work uh, and uh, those moral choices are important. But they're in an arms race that uh, they're gradually uh, losing and they will eventually lose um, because it simply becomes harder and harder to track these uh, transactions. The Lightning Network is another privacy technology that is going to help with that together with some of the other technologies being introduced. But it, yeah, it is a weakness. Uh, and that's also why I'm interested in the broader ecosystem because Bitcoin isn't alone. It's part of an ecosystem of cryptocurrency, some of which have stronger privacy characteristics um, that are very easily interchangeable with very low barriers and switching costs. And I think it's important to look at the ecosystem. Do you think that uh, Bitcoin might be developing too slowly? I feel like we've been stuck on five transactions uh, per second for a very, very long time. And I don't see um, where we're going, aside from the Lightning Network, of course, where we're going to go beyond that. And a lot of people do call that out as a weakness of Bitcoin, that it hasn't mm -hmm. been perhaps developing as fast as some of the other innovations we see happening across the crypto ecosystem. Well, uh, Bitcoin is fundamentally the most conservative uh, system out there because it's intended to be extremely robust and secure and able to resist attacks by collusion or cooperation between nation state level actors. Uh, and so far, it has resisted attacks at that level, whereas many of the smaller competitors that are attempting to scale things up by reducing decentralization um, are going to pay a very big price and they're much easier to attack. Uh, than, than Bitcoin. So from that perspective, that's a design choice. It's not an accident. It's, not a, um, it's, it's a deliberate design choice to keep things conservative uh, in order to maximize decentralization. There are some fundamental design trade-offs here uh, that you can't just wave away. Uh, if you create a system where everybody has to validate everything, and that's a security feature, um, then that system will necessarily not scale. If you increase the scale of that system, then it becomes a burden on everyone who's trying to validate. And that means you lose validators until eventually you have very few validators, easily identified, easily coerced, and the system is, is vulnerable um, to attacks. So that's the fundamental trade-off. And it's not an easy trade-off to solve. Uh, one of the best solutions in my mind is to move off-chain many of the transactions that do not need to be validated by everyone while maintaining the same security model through smart contracts, and that's what the Lightning Network is doing. Um, given the ability of the Lightning Network to do uh, millions of transactions per second um, while maintaining the full security of the Bitcoin chain, I think that's a much better uh, avenue for scaling the system. It's a really revolutionary technology when you start to understand what the, the Lightning Network is. And it, like you said, it's still the very early days for yep. it. Outside of uh, the Bitcoin ecosystem specifically, I know it's a wider ecosystem overall, but what is the technology that's getting you most excited right now in, in the entire cryptocurrency space? Well, um, there's, there's a couple of technologies that are keeping me most excited. Uh, certainly, I've been interested for the past four years in, in smart contracts and blockchains that execute smart contracts on a virtual machine, uh, such as Ethereum. I've written about that in one of my books, Mastering Ethereum. Uh, from a technical perspective. And I think we're beginning to see some early uh, examples of how these can express uh, rather rich applications. 
Uh, of course, we're still at the toy scale, and there's all kinds of uh, complexity and risk that comes with that. Um, but it's very interesting to see the very rapid pace of development, for example, in decentralized finance. Um, a lot of interesting examples coming out there. And what's interesting here is that I'm hoping we'll move from the stage where technology is used to replicate or mimic the status quo, the existing set of applications. So you have a better tool and you use it to build the same thing you were building before, just bigger, better, faster. Um, and the next stage of that is where we start building things that simply could not be done with the existing set of tools. Um, that's when it really is innovative. And I think we're, we're reaching that point with decentralized finance. Um, you, you know, when we look at the internet, for example, in the early days, everyone was like, okay, how many fax machines does this replace? Um, because the only way to, to perceive the internet and to measure its value was um, by the metrics of the previous system and understand it in, in how it, it simulates or mimics the previous system. But of course, all of the value does not come from there. It comes when you that question stops making any sense. So how many bank accounts can you replace with cryptocurrency is this level we're at now. Um, when we stop asking that question, we start thinking about applications you couldn't do before. That's when we really see the innovation. That excites me. The other one that excites me equally, and for the same reasons, is the very rapid development in cryptography fundamental research that has been spurred on by Bitcoin. If you think about it, Bitcoin is the largest civilian deployment of cryptography ever. It's the largest practical application of cryptography that has reached consumer level ever, um, other than, let's say, hard, hard drive encryption. Um, and it's as such, it's, it's kind of pioneering cryptography and as a result, it's, it's spurred research. Um, zero knowledge proofs is a perfect example. The, the amount of research that has come out of, uh, in the zero knowledge proof area just in the last two years is staggering and it's moving really, really fast. All of these things within a decade will turn into practical applications that, that truly revolutionize finance. I think that's one thing that a lot of people, they get very, um anxious and impatient about how quickly this technology is going to roll out. But if you take that long term <laughs> perspective, you know, like you said, right. 10 years from now, where, where is this technology going to be? What is the application level of that going to be? Now, the final topic right. I want to touch on here with you is the Bitcoin having. Obviously, we're about, I think, 20 days away at this point. There's been a lot of speculation about what it's going to mean for Bitcoin, the markets, the miners, all, all of this stuff in a wider perspective. What's your take on the impact of the Bitcoin having? Well, interestingly enough, the Bitcoin halving is, is happening in stages because um, there are a bunch of forks of Bitcoin that, um, because of various quirks in the development, ended up mining a lot more blocks and got to the halving first. Uh, and they saw some really radical uh, effects because of the low hash rate. Um, they became vulnerable to attacks of very low cost. Um, it's kind of a preview of what happens when you have a, a system where you can move to a more profitable competitor with the same mining equipment. Now, Bitcoin doesn't have a more profitable competitor with the same mining equipment. Uh, it is the most profitable competitor, so we're not going to see that effect. Um, with the Bitcoin ha having, I think, um, in, in the short term, we're going to see a lot of volatility. People are obviously worried, and they're going to be uh, trading on, on the emotional impact of all of that. It's going to take months after the halving for everything to kind of settle down and for us to start seeing some of the fundamental impact of the constraint in supply um, that uh, that will be uh, because of the because of the halving. Um, in terms of demand, demand is still very very strong in Bitcoin, and I expect it to be even stronger as we see um, you know various uh, national experiments with currency creating very weird conditions. Uh, people need safe haven assets right now. I think Bitcoin is one of them. That's a personal opinion. I can't give you financial advice. But um, so you know, a, a whole lot of nothing is going to happen with the halving. It's just going to happen. And then 10 minutes later, a new block is going to come out. And then 10 minutes later, a new <laughs> block is going to come out. And all of the people who wrote articles about the death spiral of Bitcoin that is imminent and how Bitcoin's going to die again and again and again, they write obituaries um, so fast, are, are going to be proven wrong and, of course, are not going to revise any of their obituaries. They'll just find a new reason to write more. Uh, that's what Bitcoin does. Uh, ironically, the the story of is Bitcoin dead yet uh, is one of our greatest marketing successes because every time someone hears that it's not dead yet, 
um, that, that builds a bit of cognitive dissonance in their mind, and gradually they realize this thing is rather resilient. Haven't needed a bailout yet. <laughs> that is a great point. There is no bit bailouts for Bitcoin. Just a bit of a follow-up to that question. The long-term impact of halvings going forward, not just this halving, we're talking you know, potentially even decades uh, down the road. Do you think that the yeah. incentives will actually keep pace as we see the block rewards falling and miners needing to really subsist off of basically transaction fees at some point in the future? Well, first of all, we have a very, very long time um, to, to look at for that. And we already know what that's going to be. So people adjust their expectations accordingly on a daily basis. These profitability um, uh, considerations happen every single day. Miners look at fees and block subsidy, uh, electricity costs, operating costs, um, uh, hardware costs for mining. And they make decisions as to which miners are still profitable and which ones are not, turning off the ones that are not, et cetera, et cetera. And it's a constantly dynamically adapting uh, system. So in, in the long run, uh, you know, this we don't know, obviously, um, how this is going to play out. But from my perspective, I think that what we're going to see is uh, more transactions with more expensive fees um, substituting for the block subsidy uh, quite comfortably. And, um, you know, we, we have enough proof of work mining right now to keep the network secure. So uh, even maintaining it at this level is perfectly fine. I, I, I don't see a problem with that. It's such a long term consideration and so much will change with Bitcoin. You know, we were having this discussion at the last halving. And guess what? Lightning Network didn't even exist then. So how, how, you know, and that completely changes the equation of how fees are used to open and close channels. So um, how can we possibly predict what's going to happen in four years, in, in, you know, 50% of Bitcoin's lifetime um, in, in, uh, in a space that moves so fast? Very, very interesting stuff. Andreas, thank you so much for taking some time out of your busy schedule to come and come and chat with everyone here on the channel. Again, just a reminder, there are links down below where you can check out the YouTube channel, the podcast, and of course, get yourself one of those fantastic books that Andreas has written. If you haven't read The Internet of Money yet or for volumes two or three, you definitely got to get your hands on one of those. So Andreas, thank you so much for coming on and having a chat. It's been a pleasure, Lark. Thank you so much. Thank you.